Hi, good evening, uh, everyone. I'm Sora Mukhevar. Uh, I welcome all of you on behalf of the US Medical Association, the uh, API Vidarbha Chapter Nagpur, uh, as well as Amravati Akola, all of you here. I would, um, this is a very interesting uh, sort of a hybrid new age uh, CME that we have organized today. And uh, we have uh, the national chairpersons. Okay. We have the national chairpersons, Dr. Ashok Chaudhary, who is joining us from New Delhi, Dr. Akash Shukla, who is joining us from Mumbai, Dr. Mithun Sharma, who is joining us from Hyderabad. I would like to welcome the national chairpersons who will be logging in online. And next, I would like to uh, invite and welcome the chairpersons here in Nagpur. Dr. Lani, Dr. Abhiram Paranjpe, uh, Dr. Ramesh Mundle, sir, please. Uh, yes, thank you. And Dr. Surya Vanshi, who will be joining us uh, in a few moments. Thank you. And uh, good evening to everyone in, uh, in Jabalpur. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Deepak Bharani, Dr. Prashant Punekar, Dr. Ramesh Chawlani, uh, Dr. Pankaj Asati, and Dr. Manish Tiwari. I would like to say uh, hello to all of you. Yes, so yeah, just to confirm your mics and everything is working. So <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Uh, next uh, from uh, Amravati, we have Dr. Ajay Dafre, Dr. Kishore Kadu, Dr. Amit Kavimandan, Dr. Pankaj Ingre and Dr. Monali Nistane. So I'd like to say hello to everyone in Amravati. Is, uh, looks like everybody's seated and comfortable. Wonderful. And then uh, Akola, we have Dr. Ravindra Chaudhary, Dr. Prashant Vaichal, Dr. Prashant Pofarkar, uh, Dr. Ashish Tapadia, and Dr. Shivaji Thakre. So good evening to everyone in Nakola. Thank you for coming and uh, gracing the occasion. Uh, and I would like to thank the, um, the API Vidarbha chapter Nagpur, Dr. Ajay Kaduskar, um, who's the chairman, and Dr. Sandeep Pofarkar, who's the secretary. Uh, thank you, API uh, Jabalpur, Dr. Ashish Dengra, who's the president, and Dr. Ankita Grawal, who's the secretary. Uh, and thank you, API uh, Vidarpa Chapter Amravati, Dr. Avinash Chaudhary, uh, who is the president, and Dr. Trupti Zavade, who is secretary, and, uh, Dr. and API Vidarpa Chapter Akola, Dr. Ravinder Singhi, and the API team at Akola. So thank you so much, uh, and we welcome you all. And uh, we welcome all the online uh, attendees uh, who have been uh, eagerly waiting. I suppose it's a little delayed start today. So thank you. And I uh, hand over the proceedings to the chairpersons for the evening. Thank you. Good evening, all. It's a clinical meeting, but it appears like a grand conference, national conference. So welcome all my <coughs> colleagues and seniors for this CME. Uh, it said that eyes see what brain knows. But here, first we have to see, the, our eyes will see what the cases are so that our brain will learn. So uh, to start with the proceedings, <coughs> I welcome my co-chairpersons. And uh, I request the first presenter, uh, Dr. Pawan Doble, to come up with this case. It's visible. Good evening, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank API Vidabha chapter, Dr. Mukewa and Dr. Saurabh for giving me this opportunity to present this case. So I am going to present two cases of pyrexia of unknown origin and we'll see how it progresses. So this is a story of 52 year old gentleman, no comorbidities, immunocompetent, presented to us with fever of three weeks. It fever was around 101 degree Fahrenheit intermittent with an evening rise temperature. There were no clinical localizing features, no weight loss or loss of appetite to this gentleman. He has a past history of mild COVID infection for which a month ago he has received favipiravir and oral steroid for total nine days. On general examination, his vitals were stable. There was no obvious lymphadenopathy and systemic examination was also unremarkable. This was his labs. When he presented to us, he has high counts, which were polymorph predominant. 
and subsequently it settled with spontaneously with some antibiotic treatment his lfts were normal with normal alphos normal transaminases renal functions were also normal this was his microbiology workup blood culture grew no growth urine cultures were normal dengue uh, igm and ns1 antigens were also non reactive scrub typhus was non reactive montux was negative and all other viral infections and autoimmune workup was negative imaging wise we did, his chest x ray was normal the nhr ct was done to see any hidden focus which was also normal and 2d echo showed no vegetations with this history we were ag again thinking ki what is the diagnosis where we are missing so we did a ultrasound abdomen which showed multiple hypoechoic lesions in segment 6 of right lobe of liver initially thought liver abscess this is his ct which was done after the ultrasound uh, this thing ct confirmed the presence of abscesses in segment 6 of liver which is shown by this red arrow and then we decided to biopsy it so fnse was done fnse showed epithelial granuloma under the inflammatory background in which confirm tuberculosis as the cause he was started akt4 on um, in the may and he is a febrile and asymptomatic right now so i'll present the second case and then i'll proceed to the discussion part the case two she was a 21 year old female presented with a history of 3 and 1/2 months of fever this was a fever pattern her chest x ray also was normal she was also immuno competent no comorbidities but her lab showed these values high alkaline phosphatase with a normal other parameters so for this high alkaline phosphatase and uh, liver biopsy was done us guided which again showed epithelial granuloma in the background attt was started and you can see the remarkable change in fever pattern on follow up after 12 days in opd her sgt sgpt improved significantly alkaline phosphatase also improved so comparison of these two cases shows us that both were immuno competent the first case has liver lesion but a normal alp the second case has we um, Raise alkaline phosphatase, but her imaging showed nothing. Ultrasound was normal. So differential in these cases, like immunocompetent individuals, what should be the differential? Since we are endemic for tuberculosis, our first differential would be tuberculosis. Other differential I'll discuss subsequently are non-tubercular mycobacteria, hepatic parasitosis like fasciolosis, sarcoidosis, histoplasmosis, Langen cell histocytosis, brucellosis, and Hodgkin's lymphoma. other mimickers for the imaging are hepatocellular carcinoma liver mets hepatic parasitosis liver abscess and cholangiitic abscess but this differential have typical history and classical imaging so they can be easily differentiated on classical imaging features so coming to hepatic tuberculosis it is well described uh, with widespread miliary tb but isolated affection of liver is very very rare even that to even immunocompetent patients are it's extremely rare, rare. if there is coexistent immunocompromised status then the frequency can rise up to 75% the common presentation of isolated hepatic tuberculosis would be fever weight loss abdominal pain and raised alkaline phosphatase in 80% of the cases most commonly the liver is involved as a part of disseminated tb but as you can see the diffuse involvement like granulomatous hepatitis in our case 2 and the typical hypoechoic lesions granulomas in our case one is also seen so 80% of cases are miliary part hepatic tuberculosis are miliary 80% diffuse involvement the infection origin is lungs and they classically on ct scan they see we see as multiple dispersed low density micronodules where in local isolated hepatic tuberculosis it is only 20% of 10 to 20% of the spectrum the infection source is gastrointestinal system they present with typical hypodensitic nodules hypoechoic nodules on ultrasound and ct scan examination so this is a series a retrospective study of granulomatous hepatitis from india 
where in most common cause was 55% was tuberculosis. Other causes are brucellosis, uh, which I listed earlier. Parasitic, amoebic liver, this thing, neoplastic and sarcoidosis. So non-tubercular mycobacteria, they generally uh, are in the setting of immunocompromised uh, or solid organ transplant. There is the history of this thing. And partly, they are a part of uh, disseminated process rather than isolated infection is very, very rare. Brucellosis, mostly in Mediterranean countries. Consumption of uh, unpasteurized milk or livestock. Uh, there is a history of livestock farming. Hepatic involvement is only seen in 2 to 3 percent cases. And typical diagnostic, diagnostic test is anti brucella agglutination test. Sarcoidosis, the liver involvement, though it is very high, 50 to 65 percent histologically, it is usually asymptomatic. The liver involvement doesn't cause any problem to the patient. But it present as focal nodular hypodense lesion in liver and spleen. But there is always concomitant mediastinal and hilar lymphadenopathy. Most common abnormal LFT in this case is also raised ALP. Histoplasmosis, again, if the patient is coming from gangetic belt, patient is immunocompromised, uh, there is primary lung involvement almost always. It, isolated disease is extremely rare. The other differential are like uh, parasitic infection, there is a history of seafood ingestion. In lymphoma, hepatic involvement is mostly secondary form in a known Hodgkin's disease. Langen cell histocytosis, it, the most of patients are children and uh, there are accompanying lytic bone lesions. So my take home messages for the audience is, hepatic TB is an extra pulmonary expression of active tuberculosis disease always. Isolated hepatic involvement is very rare. Pyrexia of unknown origin with raised ALP, there should be high index, on, high index of suspicion. Imaging studies can be normal, like in our second case, but hepatomegaly is present mostly. Liver biopsy with mycobacterial culture and histology is the most specific for diagnosing this hepatic TB. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pawan. An excellent... Uh cases, I mean, it's very rare to find hepatic tuberculosis isolated in, in internal medicine practice. I congratulate you for this. Uh, way back in 1976, when one of my friend had PU, uh, he was finally referred to Jaslok Hospital where he was seen by Dr. Lele and he did a liver biopsy at that time and confirmed that it was tuberculosis. So I remember, vividly remember that case. Otherwise, I mean, it's very difficult to, maybe do not, uh, unless you, you rightly said that Unless you have a patient with PU and isolated rise of ALP, ALP. or a patient of milieu tuberculosis where hepatomegaly would, you would think of uh, having hepatic tuberculosis. Any questions can, can or I comments? A I got a bad throat. Uh, the idea of presenting this patient was that he had uh, big lesions on liver which were not picked up, uh, which is not a common phenomenon in tuberculosis. Right. Normally, they present as pyrexia of unknown origin and raised alkaline phosphatase. So, abscess like presentation is not very common in clinical practice. I don't know what is the experience of national faculty Dr. Ashok Chaudhary and Akash Shukla. Yeah, Akash and uh, Dr. Ashok, sir, uh, you can unmute. Uh, you may have any comments. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, the very interesting case, and uh, Dr. Aditya Kare has uh, has uh, published a series of uh, primary hepatic tuberculosis. Uh, he had presented it in 2018 in the DDW as an oral paper, and. Uh, it was uh, there actually, uh, this was, these were the patients who were thought to have HCCs and uh, they, had, they had been referred to Tata Memorial Hospital as HCC and then they uh, on histology turned out to be uh, hepatic tuberculosis so it is not it should have a high index of suspicion just like uh, dr mukhevar said that you know it is very easy to uh, lesions and uh, 
think of HEC or tumors or metal and, and very often uh, misdiagnosed. The key thing here is the presentation is not like that usually that of uh, acute pyogenic liver abscess. The presentation is more insidious and uh, subacute or uh, chronic and sometimes they may present even without fever. And uh, we in fact uh, uh, had the published case report of uh, eight cases of primary hepatic TB which uh, presented with uh, secondary uh, venous thrombosis, either portal vein thrombosis or hepatic vein thrombosis. So that is another uh, presentation of uh, primary hepatic TB, which could be possible that they invade the portal vein or they uh, cause thrombosis of the hepatic vein and therefore the patient has presented with abdominal pain when we deal with these patients. A very interesting case, knowledge difference. Yeah, thank you. I think Dr. Akash has given a lot of feedbacks. Here I want to say one more thing in the first case. Uh, a patient have COVID, first received steroid and antivirals. Then after some point of time coming with a fever for a long standing and having a TLC high. So TLC 16,000. This is a very interesting series we have seen to have liver abscess with COVID. So COVID with liver abscess has been seen as a series. In fact, we got publications also. So when I got this in this patient, that is one of my possibility because I have not gone into ultrasound, but when TLC is high, COVID, steroids, so one of the possibilities is liver abscess with the ILP is on the hair side. That is one. Two, because of long duration of history of fever, one more thing you should think of a fungal infections. And then uh, third is definitely tuberculosis. But in first case, uh, though tuberculosis can be suspicion, but in absence of imaging, I should consider the third. One. Then when gone for a CT or ultrasound, you can see the image is not very much characteristic of abscess. It is very thick world, is not having a typical of uh, liquefied content also. That is where it makes the hints that it is not a pure case of abscess we are dealing. So that makes suspicion of having something either fungal or tubercular. So I, I want to say how our spectrum in abscess was changed from time to time. So when you got this having a not typical of abscess, so we have gone for a biopsy. Otherwise, we won't go for a biopsy in the case of a liver abscess we suspected. So when you go gone for the biopsy, then we got a tuberculosis. So here, this tuberculosis is either coming over a period of time, aggravated because of the steroids during tuberculosis, uh, during COVID, or uh, not related that we don't know. So this is a suspicion. And most important here to the clinicians as a physician is most important the history. We know from the days evening rise of temperature in India should be first think of tuberculosis unless otherwise excluded. So that is always the dictum and we have to keep in remember and very soft signs as said the patient is well preserved short duration of history but the liver function is alkaline phosphatase I think first case is not so high but that is also another suspicion can keep up. So here just my son for the second case also when you get a, any person of having fever with a liver is just palpable or uh, maybe enlarged and sap GGT is on the higher side, you should keep a biopsy as a armamentarium for you to the diagnosis. That gives a lot of help, particular tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, or any infiltrates, even lymphoma also seen. Pure, we are not able to see anything anywhere. That I can say in case of PO, two things helps us a lot. That is one a PET CT and a liver biopsy if you are having a Race so these two, uh, I think, uh, my takeaway from your two cases, which are excellent and I think a, need a very focused approach to the patient. Thank you. Yeah, I think I would like to add to... Uh, how's... Okay. I'd yeah, like to add to what Dr. Ashok was saying. So the spectrum is so, so varied. That I'll tell you the last week we did a liver biopsy for a case of suspected autoimmune hepatitis where received steroids outside and was not responding. And to my certain surprise, the liver biopsy came, the alkaline phosphatase was pretty much normal. The liver biopsy came as tuberculosis, which was positive even for uh, in the PCR. So I had a talk with the pathologist because I was not convinced because it was so much like an autoimmune, but it turned out to be tuberculosis. Because you started ATT, patient is uh, possibly will respond. 
And it all depends, as you said, where you are practicing. So this actually, once we had a dilemma between sarcoid and TB. And as it is said that if you are practicing in the US, we will think sarcoid first if we are not sure about the granulomas that we are see seeing. But if in India with a living temperature, yes, tuberculosis will be always the first diagnosis. Though recently we had histoplasmosis in one of our cases, I think that was presented in drills, this is one of our students. But yes, it's a very interesting case. I appreciate uh, doing a liver biopsy and I think with Saurav doing a lot of US guided liver biopsy. That's a boon to the, to the fraternity now because he can get targeted biopsies and see what's going on inside. Thank you. Uh, Pawan, there are two questions in the auditorium. These are the roll of PET scan and MRI with bicomal imaging in uh, differentiating hepatic SOLs and gravulomas. So, um, best would be gold standard is a biopsy, histology. So mm -hmm. if we find a lesion, then better to take a tissue out rather than doing this thing. Yeah. Thanks, Pawan. Thank you, sir. Pawan, can I just answer, add to the answer? Yes, sir. Yeah. So a uh, PET scan will not be able to differentiate between an abscess or, uh, and a malignancy. Uh, and therefore it should be discouraged for this purpose. And, and like what uh, Pavan said, we would always do a biopsy when you are in a dilemma. But if you do a proper multi-phase MRI with a delayed imaging, that actually is very useful to differentiate between uh, abscess and an HCC, especially or uh, metastasis. So instead of doing a PET, a very good multi-phase, including a delayed phase MRI is what is required, where you want to look at the diffusion, where you want to look at the delayed washout, and then you make a call whether it is an abscess or a, uh, or a malignancy. I think that is where we will get more answers. But at times, whenever you are in a dilemma, biopsy. Yeah, uh, I think uh, there are no more questions in the chat box also. So we now proceed to the next case. Uh, I uh, also request the Amrauti, uh, Jawalpur and Akola people to put their questions in chat box so that we can uh, get them also. The next case is an uh, interviewing case, uh, a case of stiff liver, but from what? That is the title. And Dr. Saurav is presenting. Okay. <clears throat> okay, hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. So, this is an interesting case that I see, I've seen. Uh, titled it as Stiff Liver, uh, but from what? I'll uh, take you through the case. This was seen last year. <clears throat> 30 year old male presented with decreased vision two months ago. He was diagnosed to have some sort of keratitis. Uh, fungal, viral, unclear, but it's just recovered with conservative management. Interestingly, he had a weight loss of 30 kilograms. That was a substantial weight loss uh, in three months, and he appeared very cachectic. He had intermittent diarrhea as well since three months with uh, the classic appearance of oil or fat in stool, uh, suggestive of a steatorrhea. So he presented with these symptoms to my clinic, now, his past social history was, uh, was negative for alcohol or smoking. He did chew tobacco. His past medical history was significant for pulmonary tuberculosis 1.5 years back with history of diabetes uh, being diagnosed three years ago. He had no surgical history. On physical examination, uh, it was notable for uh, cachexia and he was very frail, thin-built individual. And uh, as you, you can confirm that this person has truly lost weight when you look at their pants and they're very loose. And uh, he had a scaphoid abdomen and uh, he had mild edema of feet. So those were the relevant findings on physical examination. I had uh, some outside investigations to go by. So his ultrasound was notable for uh, quote unquote liver parenchymal disease and upper GI endoscopy showed some reflux, hiatus, um, hernia and antral gastritis. 
and colonoscopy was normal. Now, with such profound weight loss, the only thing that was uh, visible was mild rise in LFTs, OTPT of 97 and 88, and uh, OTPT again 60 to 84 in uh, next set of labs with mildly raised alkaline phosphatase, and bilirubin was normal. <clears throat> Further workup uh, was negative for hepatitis B and C, ANA, ASMA was negative, vitamin B12, serial plasmin levels were normal. PTG, IgA was negative, uh, urine routine showed trace proteins, there was not a lot of protein in the urine, and pus cells uh, were a little high, suggestive of urine tract infection, and uh, urine protein creatinine ratio was low, 0.25. Now, ultrasound Doppler at our center, showed uh, a hepatomegaly with some fatty infiltration on the ultrasound. The Doppler was normal, there was no thrombosis, the pancreas could not be seen, and the spleen was normal and there was minimal ascites. This fibroscan uh, was obtained and showed a F4 fibrosis with a median stiffness of 15.7 kilopascal units, and he had S1 steatosis per the fibroscan. And a CT ab abdomen outside <clears throat> for us to review was suggestive of chronic pancreatitis with concerns for chronic liver disease with minimal ascites. No space occupying lesion was seen in pancreas or liver. So overall, putting it together, we had a patient who was cachectic, had severe weight loss, and uh, there was no malignancy. He was a young gentleman. His only findings were a fatty liver with some elevated LFTs. But his fibro scan was suggestive of a very stiff liver with F4 fibrosis concerning for cirrhosis. Now, he's, he's not, he definitely did not consume alcohol per the patient, the family, asking them multiple times. And uh, hepatitis B, C tests were negative. So this was a little perplexing. And it did not fit in because uh, a fatty liver in such a cachectic gentleman uh, is not something you would expect, especially with no alcohol history. So I... Uh, in short of ideas, I said, uh, let's do a liver biopsy because um, that's the only thing that seemed a little abnormal uh, on exam. So I'm just going to skip forward. So we are doing us guided liver biopsy. This is a parenchymal biopsy. We use large 19-gauge uh, needles for this, uh, which now uh, we've had excellent results, and these results are sort of comparable to percutaneous biopsies obtained uh, in a, in a routine patient. So this is painless, and that's why we do this procedure nowadays. And uh, to our surprise, uh, this, is, uh, this is what this patient had. And Dr. R. Ravi is here. And uh, we can pass over the mic to Dr. Ravi, who is uh, in the audience, who's an expert GI pathologist, who we trust in all our liver biopsies. Actually, what hmm. we saw was, was uh, really a very surprising, we were expecting a liver parenchymal disease and we saw a lot of fatty infiltration and uh, this was macrovascular uh, steatosis. Whenever you see steatosis, either you see macro or micro. Here we saw macrovascular steatosis. Mm -hmm. We saw some areas and actually I would like to say that it showed more than 11 to 12 portal tracts. You have to see minimum six portal tracts. So in all USD guided and also all the biopsies which we are, we are getting US guided, we are seeing very adequate liver biopsies. And we saw, was in this case, we saw also ballooning hydropic degeneration of hepatocytes and lymphocytes in the periportal area. And by definition, to call it steatosis, what you have to see is fatty infiltration with inflammation and hepatocytic change in the form of ballooning hydropic degeneration with or without fibrosis. Here, 80% of the core was showing fatty infiltration. So this was a case of steatosis, something like NASH. So differential diagnoses are so many, which I think Saurabh is going to talk about. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. So the possibilities we entertained, uh, whether this is NASH, but this patient is cachectic with a 30 kg weight loss. Alcoholic hepatitis, uh, presuming that he's lying to us, but uh, that didn't seem to be the case. The family was very confident and the patient was uh, seemed honest at least to us. Uh, hepatitis C, now his antibodies were negative, whether this is an acute viral phase, but again, this, this degree of steatohepatitis would not be expected. The drug induced, we asked him multiple times whether he had consumed any alternative medications, steroids, but there was absolutely no history of any alternate medicines which could potentially cause this. 
Uh, Wilson's, but again, I, I would not imagine this degree of fat to be there in Wilson's disease. And happy to hear uh, anybody else if they've uh, experienced something. Severe protein energy malnutrition. Now, again, uh, what from what I've uh, learned or seen, oftentimes these patients have liver dysfunction, where they have uh, liver failure, coagulopathy, uh, and mitochondrial dysfunction. So, what uh, happened next? We did decide to interrogate the patient further. And uh, what he told me was that he's been working in a flex printing press since many years. So now we wonder how the flex printing press is correlating with this. And uh, what we, uh, and I'll tell you why, and what we felt was that this patient has what we call as toxin-associated steatohepatitis. And uh, this was the first time that I had seen a case like this. It's also called TASH. It's toxin-associated steatohepatitis. He did have severe protein energy malnutrition, whether it was contributing, I'm, I'm not uh, entirely certain to his findings. And uh, just to explain, uh, all the toxin exposure that the human body gets, uh, liver ends up being the first pass uh, for metabolism. And uh, liver basically acts as uh, an organ which detoxifies the environmental toxicants, and it has large amount of copper cells, which are the macrophages largest in human body, and they basically lead, uh, when they're exposed to toxins, they cause, uh, they, they, they secrete cytokines, which ultimately lead to liver toxicity and damage. If you look at um, liver, uh, if you look at liver uh, toxin-associated injury, uh, I don't have these labeled, but if you can see, it can vary from necrosis and inflammation, cholestasis, cirrhosis, fatty liver, or even cancer. So you can have a varied pathology when it comes to drugs or toxins-associated liver injury. And uh, in this sort of series that we have, patients uh, can have varying, varying types of pathology, as I described. And this patient actually was getting exposed to vinyl chloride from the flex printing press where he was working over many years. And uh, the solvents toluene, and, uh, and this is what ends up getting absorbed in human body. And this is what led to the, uh, to the TASH in this patient. So thank you. That's my case. And this patient, unfortunately, hasn't actually come back to us yet. Uh, he's, we followed up over the phone yesterday, and he's gained 7 kgs. Now, we presume his weight loss was from chronic pancreatitis as nothing else turned up positive. Uh, he stopped working in vinyl factory, and his LFTs, unfortunately, didn't get them yet. Uh, but uh, he's doing well clinically. That's, that's the case. Thank you. Thank you, Saurav, for uh, presenting to us a very unusual case. Apart from withdrawing him from the exposure, uh, did you give any other specific medication for him? Uh, no, I, I figured this exposure was primarily the reason for him to develop this. He didn't have fibrosis, so that's, that was one good sign. And any Mallory's bodies on the histopath? So I don't think there were Mallory bodies on the, on the histopath, no. no. So he had steatitis, but not, uh, means not metabolic uh, Syndrome-related yeah. steatosis. So he had steato, steatosis plus hepatitis. That, that was there. Yeah. Uh, but no malaria bodies and uh, uh, no fibrosis, yeah. more importantly. So we'll be we interesting. We specifically mentioned that. In our histopathology report, we did mention that there were no malaria bodies, no hint, uh, because we were very particular. In fact, we made a comment also that this does look like probably toxic hepatitis. Yeah. What was the cause of chronic pancreatitis? Or yeah, it uh, so, sounds like tropical because he did not have any alcohol consumption and he's a young gentleman. So, but he did have fairly severe. The diabetes pain. was probably related to that. Uh, yes, it's probably. That, that was, was the reason. obese to start with. Right? He had a 30 kg weight loss. Yes. yes. <laughs> that, that is surprising because uh, it was very unusual to see that degree of weight loss. We do see chronic pancreatitis all the time, but that degree of weight loss was very unusual. That's what prompted me to do liver biopsy because I, it just did not fit in. The degree of weight loss with mild LFT rise, with F4 fibrosis, with uh, liver did not clearly appear, cirrhotic nodular. So I, I, I just did not feel comfortable uh, letting him go and labeling him as chronic pancreatitis. And therefore, I did liver biopsy in this patient here. Uh, yeah, Dr. Saurav, it is an excellent case. Only one thing for uh, my curiosity. So, in case of rapid weight loss, also you can get significant amount of steatosis. Mm -hmm. And mostly in case of rapid weight loss, 
you will likely to get macrosteatosis. So here it may be having the super added uh, with weight loss. Obviously, you have to know the cause for his weight loss. If you think TAS can cause weight loss, is there any literature wise? Yeah, that's that's also what I was thinking. But no, apparently not. I think it, it's yeah. not. Uh, so reason for we don't exactly. This is the diagnosis we got in histopathology that he's having steatosis and likely related to the exposure. But I don't think we can able to explain his weight loss because he's working for such a long time. And a rapid weight loss around 20 to 30 kg in some period of time. And also, if you think that this task is because of this uh, exposure, then uh, is it possible to correlate to the pancreatitis also? Yeah, it is a separate entity. Yeah, no, this, I'm not sure the, that, that's the only explanation we had because he had steatorrhea. So that, I would imagine, is the, is the possible, the only plausible explanation for his weight loss. What I was suggesting, Saurabh, uh, is with a genetic polymorphism, we mm -hmm. is commonly have PNPLP mutations. It is known to have lean NFLDs, very commonly seen nowadays. And basically, so, in the age group adolescents, we see nowadays, mm -hmm. uh, these are uh, not obese patients, but they have yeah. severe degree of steatosis and steatohepatitis going in cirrhosis. So, genetic yeah. mutation studies, specifically PNPLP3 mutations, they are known to cause and certain metabolic disorders. Most of the TASH would have macrovascular or microvascular. What do you think? They would be so micro. I, I, I think uh, macrovascular steatosis is what we mostly Maybe see. genetic study is helpful. Yeah. yeah. But unless it's the, the microvascular steatosis has a poor prognosis with liver dysfunction, but this is not that type. This was a macrovascular with, a, I, I suppose, reasonable prognosis. Saurabh, can I come in? Yes, yes, please. please thank you. So again, uh, excellent case and I think a very good uh, clinical dilemma, whether the steatosis is because of malnutrition or it is because of the toxin exposure. And uh, we cannot discount the toxin exposure definitely here. Uh, this is something which is uh, underreported. Uh, In fact, uh, this term was initially TAFLD and then a sub subgroup of that is uh, TASH, that is uh, steatohepatitis. And in fact, now uh, the newer concept is because these are organic uh, compounds, they can actually go and get stored in the subcutaneous fat and then they can get released over a period of time. And that is why these have been named as uh, persistent organic pollutants or POPs. Mm -hmm. And they are responsible for sustained uh, weight loss. And the most common of these are the poly, uh, uh, polychlorinated phenyls, which is what is actually uh, used in the printing press also. What is also interesting is uh, whether, the, I think this again the interesting thing, whether the weight loss was purely because of the chronic pancreatitis or whether there was uh, another toxin which was a mitochondrial uncoupler, uh, you know, the, which, which, which could have contributed to the weight loss. Many of these nitrogenous compounds are actually mitochondrial uncouplers. And uh, as you know, uh, you know, from the World War II experience where uh, the people who were handling the TNT, uh, trinitrotolidine, they had on an average 20 to 25 kg weight loss. Uh, they, so we know that uh, if those who handle these nitrogenous compounds, they can actually have weight loss. So we'll have to find out whether any of these nitrogenous compounds are used in this industry. But also we need to find out whether he was actually handling the ink mm -hmm. before we really say that uh, it is responsible because just inhalational, uh, I don't think will cause such profound thing unless there is somewhere absorption from the skin surface. So I think a lot of food for thought for all of us and also highlights the importance of occupational history, which you are drilled to take when you are undergraduate students, but sometimes we tend to forget in our busy practice. Thank you. Oh, no, great comments. Thank you. No, it, it, very interesting. I think uh, that possibly may be the reason and the explanation as we don't have any other explanation. <laughs> Thank you. So there are some questions in the question box. So, so I want to, is there any role of a stool test to diagnose any fatty liver in that? Stool. Uh, what was a stool uh, test? Sorry, there's a role of stool test to diagnose yeah. fatty liver. Not that I've heard of yet. And uh, uh, Dr. Riaz asked that uh, whether that uh, this was explained by biopsy, explained by TASH only, or it can be a 
protein energy malnutrition case pure yeah no that uh, based on the exposure we diagnosed it as dash however protein energy malnutrition is associated with weight loss or well, is associated with development of fatty liver uh, studies with ruen y gastric bypass patients who have lost 20 to 30 kg weight loss yeah. can develop uh, fatty liver uh, but there are series of patients who have developed liver dysfunction which is not the case in, in our in our setting so i think uh, they they probably contributed and i'm not entirely sure if that totally explains the uh, the finding no uh, one last question was that okay, what was the treatment other than withdrawal of the exposure no we haven't given any treatment yeah. because we presume that's the reason for his dash thank you okay. as from the online i think just uh, one small comment uh, this is dr mithun here so this initial fibro scan value do you think it was high because of uh, we did a fibro scan in presence of ascites that gives a false positive false high value so we see it very frequently being done and they land up with a high fibrosis because the biopsy did not show any fibrosis at all and the steatosis hepatitis pattern was not that high that the liver enzymes were not uh, above 200 or so to give a false positive high fibro scan value yeah and thank you mithun actually this patient had my very minimal ascites so i don't uh, feel that was uh, the reason for the fibro scan to reflect a f4 fibrosis but but yes i, I believe uh, the degree of steatosis this patient had i'm not sure if that's that was contributing to the stiffness of liver and as we all know fibro scan is only about 80 to 85% uh, sort of accurate so to speak Uh, it's really good for f4 fibrosis by and large but uh, this will this was definitely odd that he had uh, 90% or more steatosis uh, steatosis and uh, turns out with f4 which we don't usually would expect to see yeah thank you thank you if we are made to establish a cause and effect relationship between this polyvinyl chloride and the clinical um, scenario which you have which test can be done the no, cause I... and effect relationship between the agent you are suspecting and the clinical mm-hmm. feature you are getting so i'm not sure if there's any tests available that will determine whether this particular exposure is leading to this uh, that's what we look through literature there's nothing in terms of tests it ends up being a, a sort of rat studies done in the past for exposure to certain chemicals and demonstrating the changes in the liver and uh, there are no blood tests available to determine this now it's all purely based on occupational history and and knowing what chemicals this patient or a person is getting exposed to i you would imagine so <laughs> it stopped yes that's true here, here. yes that's true that's true his, his diabetes wasn't that severe though that's why we did not seem it's it, everything was out of proportion in terms of we see diabetes all the time but 90% fat cells this would not be typically seen okay thank you sort of now uh, dr bhushan will uh, tell us about the uh, intractable cholestatic hepatitis Uh, thank you dr mukhyawar sir for uh, allowing me this uh, case to present so i have some uh, couple of cases of uh, intractable uh, uh, cholestatic hepatitis we begin a case of an 35 year old male uh, with no com- uh, comorbidities came to us in the month of Ma- march 2021 with a chief complaint of an loa discoloration of an urine and sclera since a month the severe troublesome generalized itching since 20 days and loss of appetite since last one month on on the onset the patient having a insidious type of jaundice which was slowly progressive there was no prodromal symptoms there is no abdominal pain fever but observed with a clay colored stool was severe pruritus constant with excoriation insomnia and irritability uh, on uh, negative history there was no significant weight loss there no history of any gi bleeding abdominal distension pedal swelling uh, 
uh, any signs of uh, liver cell failure, no history of surgery, trauma, no history of jaundice in the past, no history of any addiction, no history of any particular complementary medications the patient has taken for uh, before the development of a jaundice. Uh, so outside he was evaluated by gastroenterologist and found to have a normal CBC with normal platelets, uh, but the bilirubin was elevated to 4.6. So in the span of within uh, within seven days, the bilirubin has rose from uh, 4.6 to 17.97 with mild elevated OTPT and hardly elevated like uh, alkaline phosphatase in the range of 146, 158, 152. And the R value at the beginning was around 3.5, so rescue of it was a mixed pattern of a liver injury. By the time it went uh, progressively, the R pattern was slowly decreasing and showing more a cholestatic pattern of a liver injury. Uh, but the synthetic function of liver was normal. Outside extensively evaluated for his uh, liver dysfunction, where viral markers was negative. Uh, hepatitis A and E was also negative. The primary uh, marker of autoimmune disease was also negative. Uh, at the time of COVID, that was also done, which was also negative. Uh, inflammatory markers in the form of CRP, ESR, that was also negative. Uh, LDH was negative. Serum protein later was done outside, that was also negative. So this was a young gentleman with a severe intractable cholestasis uh, presented, even also evaluated in the outside MRCP, which was having a normal intrahepatic biliary radicals and no any essential strictures. And then it was also seen since the patient was progressively increasing jaundice, uh, this jaundice and pruritus, UHG guided liver biopsy also done outside, which was might be comment with uh, sir. This histology was totally normal. Yeah. He said there was no diagnostic uh, height microscopic pathology in this liver biopsy. So completely, so it was an adequate uh, liver biopsy and adequate portal tracts, so not giving uh, any idea about this. Uh, This was sir, 22 to this was the liver okay, biopsy. Okay. So uh, the treatment which offered outside was giving a maximum dose of uh, this uh, udka, this uh, udka, uh, cholesteramine, antihistaminic, lactocalamine lotion, anti-anxiety drugs. Hardly patient has relief for this uh, generalized itching and insomnia. So with that history, patient arrived with us with having an examination with a dicterus. There is excoriation mask seen on the limbs and trunks. Having a normal BMI per abdomen, there was a mildly enlarged liver, non-tender liver. Uh, so we did investigate, uh, we again investigated, we having a same pattern of LFT. Bilirubin was uh, near about having more at same range, 14.4, mild AST, ALT pattern, R value was coming that 1.6. And rest of all investigations were normal, ultrasound suggest of mild hepatomegaly, no IHBRD, no splenomegaly. Here we put a possibility that what the patient who's having an intractable cholesterol, so intract yeah, intractable cholestasis and outside extensively worker for his cholestasis, what it can be. So this was a possibility comes whether the patient having PSC, but MRCP was no extra diabetic strictures. Uh, PBC was unlikely in the young male having uh, this type of cirrhosis, those synthetic functions were normal. Overlap syndromes outside uh, biopsies, autoimmune markers were also negative. There was no obvious history before development of any time of complementary medications, any type of allopathic medications, any antibiotic history that was patient. Uh, and there is also no, no classical sign infiltrative, but still the patient having cholestasis, we can, whether we are dealing some infiltrative liver disorder. Any possibility can anyone can put us like here? I think I should move forward. So we did a further workup. We do the ANA, uh, ANA by IF method. Uh, second line test of anti-SLA was also negative. IgG was normal. AMA M2 was negative. ANCA was negative. Endoscopy was also negative. And CCT the abdomen done, that was also was within normal limit. So we give under much detailed history why the patient was admitted with us. We are giving best support to medications. Still patient having uh, this jaundice was elevated. We start going into back history, what uh, what is taking since that time of the COVID area was going on. Uh, we ask our medical uh, medical uh, herbal medication history, especially Giloy was coming very up surfacing, the, causing some liver injury. That was also negative. Uh, any dietary supplements uh, taken, that was also negative. Botanical environmental hepatotoxin, that was also negative. But he gives some history that in the just three months before, he has consumed uh, amoxicillin clavinolic acid for around 10 to 12 days for his acute febrile illness. So well, there was a time like around expectedly 12 weeks for development, for taking of stoppage of this amoxicillin and development of this cholesterol hepatitis. So that was only a history what we got when you go like more back, 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 what history was he was taking. So that was become that patient was taking amoxicillin clavinolic acid. So 
This was a summary of a male, a young male, was extensively evaluated for his intractable cholestasis hepatitis, and we uh, liver biopsy, MRCP was normal, and there was an amoxicillin uh, history of three months back, and just his extensively RUCAM score was we calculated at our side was having an uh, score of five, which show that it can be a possible uh, delay, though we didn't uh, do that uh, extensively work of of CMV and Epstein Barr virus. So this start reviewing about the literature on uh, amoxicillin induced liver injury. I found a paper which was published in uh, Digestive Science, which is the largest prospective study on uh, amoxicillin clavulanic acid, where they compare the clinical variables and outcomes of patient of an amoxicillin delay was compared to the overall all uh, delay in US. It was out of this cohort of around 1,000 patient, 117 patient has an amoxicillin induced uh, liver injury. And they found that it is more common in older patient, more frequent in men than women. And uh, the main time of symptom onset was 31 days. But once I go into that uh, detail history, as I pointed something, we can see that out of 117 patients, the mean onset of development of symptoms was, was, was around 12 weeks. So yes, there are some patients who's fitting into some nearly about uh, 56 days from onset of uh, taking amoxicillin, this thing. So we still it case we kept open and the patient improved. So we conservative management of, uh, of Udka uh, with some uh, lactocalamine motion and, and antihistaminics. Patient was, uh, was partly doing okay. And in the month of within, within one month, LFT is improved and a patient uh, gradually improved with his itching. And currently we just called a couple of days back. He's absolutely doing well with uh, normal LFTs. So this is a case. Why don't you think brick? Ha, sir. So brick uh, was a possibility that we comes into mind, but a brick has a history of a relapsing remitting type of cholestatic hepatitis. It was a persistent. It was a more about persistent on this. Can I, can I come in? Yes. It will take some time to diagnose. No? It will take at least two, three episodes. It might happen over a few days. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, yes, because the biopsy did not stain specifically for the, for the bile ducts and for that, uh, MDR one, two, three. So if that was stained, possibly you could have, uh, I don't know, that could be a possibility. But amoxicillin clev, we also have a case of a young doctor. It's close to five months now, uh, but then the recovery has started. It can be that also. Yeah, yeah. but uh, here I just want to say, yes, uh, the pattern of liver injury in amoxicillin clev is mostly hepatocellular or it is a mixed picture. But in your case, you're getting hepat liver injury is non in liver biopsy, you're not finding any evidence of any liver injury. So it is difficult to contribute. So yeah. in case to contribute to a delay, there should be either hepatocellular or mixed or having a static picture. But as for your biopsy, you're not finding any picture. You're telling biopsy is normal. Yes, sir. It is not possible. You should get something. If bilirubin is 12 or 14, they should at least should get a bland cholestasis. Or you should get an inflammatory injury if it is a hepatocellular pattern uh, with having mixed picture otherwise. So uh, I don't know this etiology is related to amoxicillin carbonic acid be possible or no. Yeah, the biopsy should have shown something at least. Yes, sir, Mithu, sir. But uh, as per the our uh, we have seen actually of this, there are sufficient portal tracks for what sir was seen. An adequate biopsy. And uh, incidentally, this slide was reviewed naturally because nobody was happy with normal report. So they got it reviewed at two, three places. Everybody, it was reported as normal light microscope. Since that can be more in favor of a break, you can right. say. More in favor yeah, of Yeah, adult and say PFIC, that can be. If there is fibrosis, no fibrosis, then break can be one of things. And the rightly said, you should have done the staining also. These are the standings we have missed also to be done for this uh, canal <laughs> Yes, yeah, sir, we'll take it. Uh, uh, from uh, Jabalpur, Dr. Barani, sir, uh, from Amravati and Akola teams, uh, your experiences and comments we welcome, please. Please unmute yourself, you have muted. I think excellent presentation from the Nagpur Midas team. Whatever difficult cases are coming to me, I'll send it to Dr. Mukhevar. And the tuberculosis of the liver, we have seen two, three cases in the last 30 years. 
any experiences from amravati and akola my our colleagues about such drug induced cases ियर So if you can type it in the box, maybe then we can. And uh, so I think the question largely is revolving around intractable pruritus in a positive patient for hepatitis A and E, yeah. which is probably the relapsing cholestatin variety. This patient. Huh? You like to answer? Uh, uh, no, it's okay. Yeah. No, yeah, it's okay. Sir. But I think I think largely. I, I would imagine I'm happy to have the audience weigh in and see what their experiences. I use naltrexone with good effect. After your standard uh, antihistamines and uh, cholestrol, cholestramine and uh, bile acid binding agents don't work. So naltrexone is something. It's a uh, you need to have sort of drug uh, privileges to. Uh, that's work fine. Hello. Rifampicin and naltrexone are the other options. Yes. Hello. Uh, recently we had one patient of nalandron induced liver injury with uh, intractable pruritus his bilirubin raised up to 36 and everything uh, arso deoxycholic acid rifampin naltrexone everything has been tried but still he was having intractable pruritus not able to sleep weight loss so we uh, uh, did a liver biopsy it showed a bland cholestasis only and uh, some eosinophilic infiltration likely because of nalandron and on the top of it he took some uh, ayurvedic medicines also for uh, his jaundice so uh, as he was not improving yes and some case reports were they are to give steroid in case of uh, anabolic steroid induced liver injury so i tried prednisolone with also he has not improved so later we did five cycles of plasma pharesis for him and with plasma pharesis he improved and at present his bilirubin is 7 and his pruritus is improved and his, he has gained weight of around 8 kg in last one month so he has improved with plasma pharesis so if we are not working anything any drug medical management i think we can try plasma pharesis for that great thank you ashish that was excellent mm. comments i think that's probably the last last resort sort of short of liver transplant <laughs> for these patients yes yeah. so the issue of bricks versus uh, Uh, drug induced is still uh, still open, debatable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would also like to make a comment as I was involved in the decision making partially. So this patient's biopsy, I wonder if it was either a sampling error number one or it was before the actual uh, florid manifestation set in. Yeah. I have to see the timeline and the dates because November he gets the liver by uh, he gets exposed. Uh, you know, February or sometime around then is when his LFT start rising. So uh, I'm, I wonder if that's anything to contribute. Uh, yes, sir. it was taken at a time of florid jaundice only, sir. Like yeah. the liver biopsy. Yeah. Mm. So just fastly. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I think Bhushan, you have one more. Yeah, sir. Just fastly finish with yeah. this. Is passing. It's another um, young male who's having such type of similarly uh, fl- uh, fluctuating type of jaundice since last year, severe itching since last six months, and bilateral pedal edema since last one month. uh this guy also has a history a history of eruptions over the scalp and face which was diagnosed as seborrheic dermatitis which has rece- uh, for which patient has received itraconazole for about 2 to 3 weeks before jaundice so this was an lft pattern in the e- in that year where the patient again having an uh, a very severe very high bilirubin with more of a direct component 
with mildly elevated uh, AST LT, but alkaline phosphate is elevated to more than uh, five times the upper limit of normal. And the synthetic functions was also a uh, liver was also compromised. The rest of the workup was also negative. MRCP done outside was also negative. He just came with us with this uh, finished and we just did a liver biopsy, which can be commented by Dr. R. Ravi, sir. Yes, sir. R. Ravi, sir. Yeah, sir. Actually, this biopsy is showing some uh, cholest, uh, steatosis yeah. uh, along with uh, cholestasis in the hepatocytes. You can see that brownish golden pigment there. And uh, I can see here some bile duct proliferation though in the lower uh, this thing uh, pattern with some uh, lymphocytic and neutrophilic infiltrate into the bile duct. So basically maybe mm -hmm. a, a biliary cholestatic type of injury pattern we can see here. Yeah. And you also commented upon the bile ducts in the portal tracts. Yes, number of bile ducts, see, I, I cannot make out here in this, but the last, the first picture here, down picture, they are yeah. showing a bile duct proliferation though. With the, uh, because bile duct, uh, in ductopenia, we should have less than 0.5% uh, yeah. bile ducts per uh, portal tract. Yeah. And here, they are, I, I can see the bile ducts which are uh, showing a proliferation. But yeah. it was, uh, so it was reported as a, it was a, it, I, as a, I know that that's why sir told me, but here in the picture, I can see there are bile Yeah, it was so reported as a, as a positive of an bile ducts into the portal tract and come to, we, uh, come, we conclude some, we decided it can be a, some vanishing bile duct syndrome, uh, secondary to says uh, itraconazole the patient was uh, taking. So with that label, we, we, we know the patient uh, uh, had, uh, uh, we label it can be a, some vanishing bile duct syndrome. Uh, with some of the antibodies. So the uh, large list of drugs that kind of vanishing bile duct uh, syndrome I will not go through since because of lack of time. And uh, really some of this uh, case like, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, sir. So that's one. So it, we come into a conclusion. It was an itraconazole induced. Yeah. 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 Pending is PFIC type 3 rarely hmm. yeah. present in bile duct. Yes, yes. Bile duct proliferation is known in PFIC type 3. So Maybe. I would suggest start doing genetic studies more. Yeah, you would pick up your hmm. unknown causes. Because in adolescent pediatric, we see a lot. Bhushan, the uh, jaundice was almost for a few months in this yeah, patient. Sir. Yeah. Quite, uh, quite plural, like fluctuating type of jaundice that patient was having. And yeah. after withdrawing the drug, still it persisted. Yeah, still persistent, sir. So patient has more like presented in a very uh, chronic, like severe, uh, like synthetic functions also was on the lower side, altered globulin ratio, F3 fibrosis. That was a picture the patient was but, presented uh, with us. Ultimately, he improved or what? Uh, I, by the time he doesn't, well, he went with the same jaundice. Uh, he has to, he taken a llama from us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes. Subsequent, as Sir is saying that, Sir has follow up in 2019, Sir is saying that patient had developed a cirrhosis of liver and oh. subsequently patient succumbed to his, uh, oh. uh, to his disease. Yes, sir. Yeah. So this, sir, uh, this patient had uh, itraconazole induced uh, vanishing bile duct injury, which ultimately ended up uh, causing sort of secondary biliary, biliary, cirrhosis. Secondary biliary, biliary cirrhosis, cirrhosis. cirrhosis. And he had uh, ascites and then eventually passed away uh, with some complications from cirrhosis. Yeah, yeah. 12 months history of itraconazole. Yeah, 12 months history of itraconazole consumption. This ultimately led to this, uh, yeah. this finding. I think you didn't calculate RUCAM score in this case. Uh -huh, sir, I didn't calculate this RUCAM score in this case. Just like a past, last minute, we decided, okay, we'll just put off this case uh -huh. in our case. Yeah. So, Mushan, sir, I have a question. Yeah, Akshay. Uh, so, this is to uh, all experts that, uh, around here. So, wh what is the role of uh, uh, nasobiliary drainage or bile diversion in uh, intractable cholestasis and when exactly would you do it if drugs are not working? Yeah, I really put forward this case to very senior people of her because still my career I need, I, I seen a couple of patients in AIG, we did a, a biliary drainage for intractable cholestasis which is not improving our, our standard line of uh, management. Mm -hmm. Really comment some expert people here really. Actually, it is done only in cases of PFIC type 1 where we are or in case of rare case of allergic syndrome in and uh, basically it is a 
external diversion rather than internal diversion, which is useful. So basically in PFIC, just short of liver transplant is like itching. He has no money to get it transplanted. Think of partial external biliary diversion. External. External, not, okay, internal, not internal. Because internal, it will again go in circulation. Recirculate, yeah. And yeah all bile acids should form. Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. So uh, if a patient is not responding to his uh, cholestatic symptoms, uh, to the treatment of the cholestasis or the symptoms of cholestasis, uh, in case of a drug injury, which we uh, virtually know is going to go away after some period of time, uh, except for this case. Uh, so uh, until we are waiting for that particular time when the bilirubin finally goes down and the effect of the drug wanes off, can we try temporary bilirubin diversion? That is the question. Yeah, we have the similar experience. We have uh, two patients of Briggs. Uh, they have acute crisis. One is spontaneously, another is because of some delay. In both the cases, we are able to put only ENBD, that is external drainage, and we are able to achieve a temporary remission a little bit faster way. Otherwise, uh, as rightly said, mostly these are not helpful in long run. Rather, you get more complications. So uh, we should not prefer them. If you like a break, which is like to be transient, or when you think that this is a only acute episode, just go off. Because like PFIC, or it, like this case, when it is vanishing bile duct syndrome, or it is a chronic delay, means any delay related injury lasting more than six months, or biopsy has established grade two fibrosis or more. If F2 fibrosis are above, they're unlikely to get benefit from any type of treatments, like you think of plasma exchange or do diversion, that's not going to help. In this case, only the transplant is the treatment. You have to consider to go for when, depending on the clinical decomment, that is one part. But in case of this group of patients, decomment is later. It is a quality of life. If he's having a debilitating itching, which is hampering his quality of life, where you can consider also the transplant if fibrosis has established F3 or F4. So you have to take a decision on that way. So PFIC, even chronic delay also, you have to think of a definitive way and temporary drainage only like brick cases or acute delay cases where you're not responding. So diversion has not a good role, I can say. Only it is a temporizing effect and in a very limited also limited group of selected group of assets. I, I agree with what Ashok has said. Yes, sir. Of, uh, um, plasma exchange, if it's a temporary measure, we would prefer a plasma exchange more than uh, something else. So, and to say more, many of this chronic delay actually go into transplant. During this COVID time, we had three patients, one with azithromycin and two with Giloy who ended up in chronic delay with intractable pruritus, had around 15, 16 sessions, not in our center, they went to Rela's also, and ultimately uh, two of them ended up in transplant. But I think Bhushan will remember that our biliary diversion in brick, uh, we have also burnt our fingers because of complications. Yeah. Uh, can I come in and make a quick comment? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So uh, I agree completely with what uh, Ashok and Mithun have said. Just wanted to add that uh, usually if the uh, ductopenia is involving more than 70% of the bile ducts, then uh, even if uh, we, we take care of the etiology, the reversal is very unlikely. And uh, as both of them said, uh, these patients are heading towards transplants. And therefore, uh, we should not be delaying the transplant in such cases because that takes a toll on the sarcopenia, uh, the 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 well, uh, the well being of the patient and make them prone to infections. And therefore, by delaying, we actually do a disservice to these patients. So, I think timely referral for transplant is the key, uh, key message which I would want to give in a patient who has got a progressive cholesterol disease with progressive ductopenia involving uh, substance, either having F2, F3 fibrosis, or if they have uh, more than 70% of duct loss. One question is, uh, do we see drug induced liver injury with Amox plus clav or with Amox only? So it is usually with the combination of amoxicillin and clavulinic acid. And the key thing again here is, uh, it is a delayed uh, type of injury. You do not see the, the liver injury immediately. Uh, the typical onset of cholesterol hepatitis is around three weeks after the initiation of amoxiclav. So by the time, most often the drug course would have been over 
and uh, the patient uh, forgets that he had taken uh, amoxiclav uh, three weeks ago. So typically the onset is after three weeks of uh, starting the drug and the peak injury is at around four weeks to six weeks after the ingestion of the drugs. So that is something which you have to remember and it can even lead to uh, acute liver failure. And one more question online is uh, role of steroids in uh, Delhi, especially with prolonged jaundice or cholestasis. I think that so is, yeah. the steroids may be used one to alleviate pruritus as a treatment for pruritus, second to achieve a reduction in uh, in bilirubin uh, in patients uh, because of its whitewash effect. But these are very soft indications. the The key indication is when you have drug induced secondary autoimmune hepatitis. I think that is where there is the major role of steroids. Uh, these are the patients where typically you will find the enzymes to be more than five times elevated and uh, they are persistently elevated. They have cholestatic hepatitis and not just pure cholestasis. And uh, here, uh, typically we would want the autoimmune markers may be positive. The difference here is you usually will not start uh, these patients on azathioprine or mycophenolate. You'll give them only steroids and you'll keep on tapering the steroids over 12 to 16 weeks. And after 16 weeks, you will try to stop the drugs to see if the uh, enzymes remain normal for around four to eight weeks. And if they remain normal for four to eight weeks, then you can discontinue the steroids completely. But in a subgroup of these patients, after once you stop the steroids, the enzymes may increase again. And these patients, you would have to treat exactly like how you treat autoimmune hepatitis. Thanks, uh, Akash. Just, Very nice uh, coverage. These cases have dis in initiated a lot of uh, take-home points for us. Uh, thanks, uh, Bhushan, for this. Uh, Saru, we have to yeah, I just from? wanted to make a comment. So there's a... Uh, okay. Akash Shukla, I think it was, uh, it was published in Gastroenterology. This was a 2013 paper on uh, population-based study to see uh, the drugs implicated in causing delay, not Ayurvedic medicines like in India, but the standard prescribed medicines. And the most common medicine was actually amoxclav, which is the most common medicine that is implicated in causing delay. And then lower down is diclofenac and uh, azathioprine and so forth. But the number of prescriptions of uh, augmentin is very high. So in, in terms of relative risk, it's say one in 3000, but the most common drug is actually augmented. Yeah, yeah completely agree with you, Saurabh. I'm Dr. Asawa. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you have partly answered my question about augmented, <laughs> that the incidence is one in 3000 cases. What should be the precaution taken? Should we give oxycodic acid along with um, oxyclav? No, 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 such oh, there is no role in that. Yeah. No, there is no role because ursodeoxycholic acid cannot prevent uh, the injury. It is a uh, idiosyncratic injury Absolutely. and uh, it causes uh, progressive cell drop as well as inflammation and cholestasis. So UDCA is of no value whatsoever in any of uh, uh, in coamoxiclave associated uh, cholesterol hepatitis. Should we be afraid of a prescribing augmentin because it is a very, very important weapon in our hand in practice? So you should, uh, not, you should give it when it is indicated. I think that is the answer. So <laughs> if it is not indicated, we should not give it or take it. I'll put it both ways. Uh, just one second, uh, Dr. Sukla, uh, if you are seeing patients of CLD, particularly NAS or a compensate cirrhosis, what is the common antibiotic? Uh, Commonly, we should prescribe. So, I. Fear of Delhi. Yeah. Yeah. So, I usually would give these patients uh, something like cefixim. It is pretty safe. Uh, or cefudroxil. Or you can give uh, these patients azithromycin. But again, azithromycin, you have to be careful because it can cause QT prolongation. So, you have to look at the other drugs. So, do not combine it with prokinetics. Do not combine it with. Uh, uh, other drugs uh, which can cause QT prolongation. So, uh, word of caution there. Fluoroquinolones are relatively safe. So, that is another drug of uh, drug group of drugs which we can use freely. Yeah. So, macrolides uh, by this particularly uh, coamoxiclav, I think should keep on the lower down. Obviously, you have to keep a strong indication, but should keep it on the lower down, I think. Uh, 
in our practice and another important thing the about the insects most of the people get for fever they get that naproxen or uh, nemesulite so that is i think uh, most of common cause also been associated these are the two things we think think of thanks everybody for a nice uh, inputs and suggestions we now move to the next case the, it is being presented by dr akash kulkarni it's a post surgical fever yeah sorry i correct myself akshay kulkarni please ट्रांसफर हो गया मोमेंट चेंज हो गया Um, good evening to one and all, to all the experts uh, in the audience as well as uh, those present online. Uh, so I'm presenting a very interesting case, uh, and uh, incidentally, uh, this is uh, uh, not a, a typical hepatology case. So post-surgical fever, how it is not always sepsis. Uh, so I'll start with uh, the brief history. A 25-year-old male with no comorbidities or history of addictions uh, presented to a different hospital with anorexia, nausea, and vomiting for one month. He had on and off fever. It was low grade and was responding uh, to paracetamol. And also uh, he was uh, having some intermittent postprandial right upper quadrant pain. He eval he got evaluated somewhere else. And uh, he was found to have some jaundice and transaminase elevation. So an uh, IgM HAV was done and it was positive. It was labeled as acute viral hepatitis. Because of the pain, he underwent uh, an ultrasound and it showed uh, GB stones. CBD was clear and there was some altered ecotexture of the liver and it was uh, attributed to acute hepatitis. He underwent a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. It was uneventful. Uh, there was no uh, uh, drain uh, in the percutaneous catheter placed uh, on day two and he was discharged. But on day five, he started developing continuous uh, and high-grade fever. Uh, the fever is high-grade. Uh, until day five, the patient had been asymptomatic, but now he comes to another hospital with fever. He got admitted. And uh, a typical uh, differential would be, a list of differentials would be, in this case, because he had uh, he has undergone a surgery, would be an infected GB fossa collection, uh, or bilioma, that is, or a biliary obstruction with cholangitis, a surgical site infection or a hospital acquired infection would also be placed in the list. So he was evaluated. So this is a summary of uh, his investigations before and after the cholecystectomy. As he was having acute hepatitis, uh, one can see that the bilirubin is high with uh, high uh, liver enzymes, normal alkaline phosphatase. Uh, he oddly had uh, some uh, cytopenia to start with, which improved later. And uh, uh, despite uh, a suspicion of post-surgical infection, his counts were not that high. Uh, he had some thrombocytopenia, but it later is fluctuating. Uh, an MR was done elsewhere to look for the uh, uh, to look for bile leak, which is an expected complication of cholecystectomy. It showed a small collection, but uh, there was no obvious leak uh, when the MR was analyzed in detail. Uh, so he will he later was admitted to our hospital after draining this collection with a percutaneous drain. 
and uh, despite that uh, despite draining the collection and uh, having uh, an adequate drainage he continued to have spikes of high grade fever and was admitted to our hospital so over the course at our hospital his uh, counts fluctuated he developed intermittent leukopenia uh, his hp kept dropping and it was mainly because of uh, a drop in the rbc count the thrombocytopenia was also borderline uh, he had a mild uh, acute kidney injury to start with uh, which improved later uh, with iv fluids uh, and did not need any uh, renal replacement therapy his bilirubin uh, sorry his bilirubin kept fluctuating but overall the trend was improving but uh, the fever spikes were not going away so we worked up his fever extensively including the test for covid-19 and the uh, typical uh, fever workup uh, battery of tests blood and urine cultures were repeatedly negative we t- we ended up seeing that collection again uh, which was there and we suspected a bile leak so uh, uh, a review uag showed a minimal collection drain was patent and in position there was minimal zero sanguinous discharge no purulent discharge so nobody sus- really suspected an infection at that site and the culture of the drain was also sterile the chest imaging was reviewed and uh, redone the x ray as well as the ct chest uh, was normal here is a representative ct common image which shows a small collection and a drain is uh, perfectly in place and it was draining a minimal fluid so the summary of investigations was that uh, he had a clear chest imaging he had no bile leak the drain was placed perfectly in position in the gb fossa and de- uh, the output was declining and no other abdominal focus of infection was present in the ct and repeated drain blood and urine cultures were negative and we are really uh, the hitting dead ends at finding any source of infection and uh, ultimately uh, we ended up uh, testing him for fungal cultures and uh, despite a negative culture we started empirical antifungals and there was no response to the fever so we decided to be really invasive and uh, went on with the uh, laparoscopic lavage of this small collection uh, extensive lavage was done of uh, the collection which is just uh, at the gb fossa and uh, uh, a wedge biopsy of the liver was taken and which shows uh, which showed only uh, cholestasis incidentally but uh, uh, the infection the infective focus was still elusive uh, and the lavage fluid culture also gave no growth so we have hit dead ends for from all sides and uh, the timeline of the patient's admission at our at our center showed persistent high spikes of fever and here is a timeline of uh, the antibiotic uh, antibiotic combinations that uh, he received uh, most of them empirical so ceftriaxone was replaced with piperacillin tazobactam later was replaced with meropenem and tigacycline as as a combination and later with the positive fungal uh, antigen report and anidola fungin was added but uh, no response and uh, we ended up giving the patient colistin although empirically but uh, no response to the fever so this is where we were stumped and we were not able to find the focus of infection uh, that is when we called in our infectious disease expert and uh, uh, we ended up uh, investigating him uh, further so ashwini is here uh, uh, yeah so uh, we uh, we were lucky enough to have our infectious disease expert and uh, he was the one uh, yes she was the one who opined that uh, uh, any fever although uh, we have a background history of a surgery and um, prolonged as well as repeated hospital admissions it may not be infective so uh, we ended up uh, investigating him further <clears throat> yeah, okay okay so i'll finish so uh, we did not uh, lose heart and uh, ended up investigating further his triglycerides were through the roof uh, so was his ferritin and ldh was also high his beta d glucan was positive so uh, uh, and ultimately uh, because he kept having cytopenias and uh, uh, he had borderline thrombocytopenia we suspected a dic and we uh, did his fibronogen and d dimer fibronogen was surprisingly low so this is where we got a hint and uh, we uh, stepped towards the next investigation he had persistent fever without any inf- any, any any solid uh, source of infection and he had fluctuating wbc counts uh, as well as thrombocytopenia also he had dyslipidemias without uh, any uh, metabolic syndrome and persistently high inflammatory markers uh, so 
like ferritin and uh, uh, right so this is the entire picture so if there are any differentials at this point from the audience or think of well sorry atrophy activation syndrome na stills uh, stills is a uh, So it is congenital adult onset stills disease as a yeah, possible same differential same. anybody else uh, suryavanshi sir has said mh macrophage activation syndrome sorry yes. so so that is where, that is where we got our hint so next uh, we ended up doing his bone marrow biopsy and uh, it was very promptly and accurately uh, diagnosed uh, by our hematologist dr nishad sir who is also here uh credit goes to him to diagnose uh, uh, of having di- diagnosed this, this case uh very perfectly with uh, the uh, biopsy the bone marrow aspirate showing hemophagocytosis uh the pink cell on the left of this slide is a large macrophage uh, there is a cluster of macrophages here actually and uh, the uh, uh rbcs are being engulfed uh, by the by the macrophages so this is a typical uh, picture of hemophagocytosis and this clinched the diagnosis of hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis which is one of the macrophage activation syndromes by the way so uh, this patient had no infection exactly. despite having uh, a post, uh, uh, a prone history and a, a relevant history of repeated and prolonged hospital admissions a surgery an invasive procedure but uh, he did not have any infection but his fever was because of hlh so that is the diagnosis so he was started on steroids uh, and the second day his fever started going down and disappeared on day 2 he was uh, absolutely stable and was discharged on day 6 with 6 uh, days of steroids and he was shifted to oral steroids with a plan of uh, continuing those for 15 days and later was uh, uh, he, he later is planned for further taper and later uh, we will we evaluate uh, currently he continues to do well as per our recent telephonic uh, follow up and uh, uh, he is doing well so he hlh uh, is a strong immune uh, reaction to any antigens hiv in this case because uh, as uh, uh, everybody might have noticed uh, the uh, leukopenia and the fever had started right from uh, the onset of uh, his prodrome uh so the hepatitis a was the likely inciting agent for hlh mostly this is secondary to infections in adults whereas in pediatric population this can be familial or genetic and uh, there are a few mutations of uh, uh, some uh, immune markers uh, or immune molecules uh, immunological molecules which uh, uh, which are responsible for a familial or congenital hlh which is mostly seen in infancy or uh, uh, in in early childhood in those cases uh, uh, we have to resort to uh, repeated uh, induction therapies with steroids and uh, intrathecal methotrexate and intrathecal steroids if there are cns symptoms but in this case there were none uh, so um, the molecular mechanisms remain elusive uh, and a high index of suspicion is always required for diagnosis uh, for this particular case the diagnostic criteria were repeatedly updated in 1991 94 and later in 2004 so these are the eight diagnostic criteria out of which five are required for diagnosis of hlh so a patient should have fever hepatosplenomegaly cytopenia of at least two lines a hemophagocytosis in one of the biopsies hypertriglyceridemia and low fibrinogen uh, a ferritin should be high or any acute phase reactant should be high like crp or esr uh, a low natural killer cell, killer cell activity is a hematological investigation and not really available across uh, all laboratories uh, similar is the case with the uh, soluble cd25 receptors but except for these two uh, our patient had these six so uh, hlh was an acceptable diagnosis and he has rightfully responded to steroids so the take home message would be not every fever is infective despite a relevant history and uh, the history and analysis is of paramount importance how we uh, missed the fact that uh, he started having fever right from the onset of the prodrome and even before surgery think out of the box when you are back against your wall despite all investigations of fee, of uh, infective focus being negative we did not lose heart so that's why uh, we landed up with the correct diagnosis and investigate thoroughly and take all the help that you can have the credit goes here to our infectious disease specialist as well as the hematologist who cleans the diagnosis thank you
So, uh, this gentleman basically, uh, I beg your pardon, you have missed two parts in the history. He had history of rash for which he was treated for drug induced rash actually. And there were multiple antibiotics which were, in fact, NSAIDs also were contributed to be the reason for rash. So, he had a history of hepatitis and then subsequently fever, rash, abdominal pain. The uh, GP calculus, I don't know what's uh, symptomatic or not, but all these things and bicytopenia, these two things were going on simultaneously since the diagnosis of hepatitis A. And then there was one surgery he had received a uh, significant antibiotic after that. And the second surgery culture was uh, quite sensitive E. coli. So all those antibiotics, I was presuming should have worked for that E. coli, but unfortunately it was not responding. The only infective part was whether there is super added enterococcus, which is associated with biliary sepsis, or since it is long-term hospitalization and multiple antibiotics, whether it is candida. So that's why we sent beta-D-glucan, but beta-D-glucan was borderline positive. Still possibility of candida cannot be ruled out in all these patients. So antifungal empirically was started and blood cultures were sent which came out negative. So basically a prolonged fever, rash, bicytopenia and hepatitis made me think that this might be a HLH and not infective etiology per se. Right. Nishan, you want to say something? Uh, this case was very pretty uh, straightforward. It was like a piece of cake for me. Uh, the bone marrow showed florid uh, hemophagocytosis. Uh, this reminds me of uh, one more case uh, post hepatitis uh, hemophagocytosis. She was a lady, uh, uh, she was a wife of a uh, CEO of a company in Bangladesh, but the, uh, the husband was from Nagpur and she developed hepatitis A in uh, Bangladesh and she was thoroughly worked up there. Fever, continuous fever, post hepatitis A. They had done everything right from everything that was negative. Finally, the family decided to come to Nagpur, and she was admitted in a hospital in Nagpur. Uh, this is this is approximately one year back, and uh, uh, we did a bone marrow. We already had a suspected diagnosis of HLH. Did a bone marrow. It showed frank HLH. So post hepatitis uh, HLH. I think uh, I have seen uh, I have seen three cases till now, and uh, pretty common. Uh, it's basically, you know, uh, clinical, it's a clinical diagnosis along with the laboratory criteria, which makes our job easy. And even one, uh, one hemophagocytic activity in the bone marrow clinches the diagnosis. They respond very good, uh, beautifully to steroids. Uh, it's the mainstay of treatment. Two very important lessons from this case is like, first thing is, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, this diagnosis should be suspected. Uh, we should have a high suspicion because we use a lot of antibiotics, a lot of investigations, uh, which, you know, which economically is uh, really taxing to the patient. And the second thing is left untreated. This uh, HLH can be really fatal. So it's a, you know, this is a very uh, a fatal condition if not untreated. So can I give a comment here? Yeah. So uh, uh, we have published our series on HLS actually. Uh, which have we have published six cases in which they were masquerading as an acute liver failure. So all of these cases were actually referred to AIG for a transplant from outside. And this is from a period of, it's a long period from 2013 to 2019. And most of them, the unusual feature was, as was mentioned, was persistence of fever in all these cases. And all of these cases uh, ultimately responded with one died, but all of them did not require a transplant. So HLS can be a mimicker, uh, not only post hepatitis, but of an acute liver failure, as well as infections, which we have seen in this case. So excellent uh, case, uh, Team Midas, uh, and compliments to Dr. Ashwini and Dr. Dakate for clinching the diagnosis. I've got uh, two questions. Uh, Dr. Akshay Kulkarni mentioned that uh, you can get diagnosis on liver biopsy. So in this patient, it was not cleaned on liver biopsy. And as a part of PO, we know that uh, bone marrow is a uh, well-described uh, investigation. So, uh, incidentally, by doing bone marrow without even thinking of HLH1, could have got the diagnosis. Though I have not personally treated or seen a case of HLH.
No, so bone marrow, I think, could should be done only when there is a clinical suspicion. Uh, I don't think uh, just randomly we would do a bone marrow for. Yes, if you are thinking of some of the some of the hematological malignancies or something going on, if you are missing, then it's a different thing, I think. Uh, but the bone marrow in our series, thirty percent of them did not show hemophagocytosis in the bone marrow sample. So it's basically out of those criteria that he mentioned, which needs to be present. Uh, if, so many uh, times it happens that actually bone marrow doesn't show anything, and yeah. we go back discuss with the hematologist that we are yeah. suspecting HLH, and then we look for it and we get the diagnosis. Yeah, correct. So high index of suspicion and lab is mandatory for diagnosis. Uh, as per the articles, uh, uh, as per the articles which have been reviewed for this case presentation, uh, ultimately it is almost always the bone marrow which has cleansed the diagnosis, but uh, uh, liver shows hemophagocytosis in uh, lesser cases than uh, uh, compared to the bone marrow. And uh, yes, uh, because the diagnosis is clinical and the criteria are almost uh, always uh, uh, through a laboratory, the fulfilled through, through laboratory investigations. So I think. Uh, 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 HLH uh, will not be the first suspicion of uh, of the uh, histopathologist or a hematologist seeing the slide. Uh, then it tends to be missed. But uh, yes, bone marrow is the one that we go for uh, if we want to demonstrate hemophagocytosis. Dr. Nishad sir can correct me if I'm wrong. So uh, rather than the liver and the spleen, which is more difficult to biopsy, a bone marrow is always of uh, is always reachable. is always easier to perform. Liver biopsy is not without risks. A bone marrow is safer. So that's why, uh, yes, a clinical suspicion, as Dr. Mithun rightly said, uh, clinical suspicion should uh, exist before, and, uh, and an indication should exist before we uh, actually do an invasive and painful procedure like this, like the bone marrow. But uh, yes, a bone marrow is more helpful than the liver biopsy in HLH. Uh, thank you, Akshay. Nice case learning thank you, curve for all of us. I think any... Uh, Akwada Amrati, Yabalpur team, you can have one or two comments, then we shift to the next case, please. Uh, so, so the cholecystectomy uh, that I uh, mentioned in the history, uh, this uh, was done elsewhere in some other hospital. And uh, the post-surgical care as well as the, uh, uh, the collection drainage was also done at some other center, uh, not at our center. So he came uh, with to us uh, with the drain in C2, having already undergone cholecystectomy and with high-grade fever. So we suspected, we naturally ended up suspecting some uh, post-surgical complications. Uh, we can take the help of uh, ferritin as a marker of insulin. And high ferritin volume when the ferritin grows towards the diagnosis, like uh, MAO or anything like that. That could have been looked into earlier. Ferritin is an acute phase reaction, so uh, high ferritin uh, in the. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, if I uh, if I heard that rightly, ferritin uh, could have been higher in sepsis, but uh, because there was there was no other evidence of infection, so a high ferritin marker was taken to be uh, the uh, marker for a non-infective or a viral infection. Is it mobile? Actually, uh, we are finishing this case here. Thanks a lot. Uh, the last case to be presented to uh, Jaundice in COVID era. I think uh, all others should mute their uh, mics uh, till the case is presented. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mukhiwar, sir, uh, it is not well. So I am presenting on the behalf of Dr. Mukhiwar, sir. <laughs> If I can possible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
this was a case of hepatitis in the times of uh, a bad covid era uh, this was a 43 year old female uh, ke, uh, presented with us with a history of an anorexia and nausea vomiting followed by jaundice since last 10 days it was having a mild pruritus there was no having abdominal pain fever no joint pain or rash there are no history of any weight loss and bleeding uh, lfts was done uh, outside we showed a uh, very uh, high bilirubin with uh, more than 20 times the elevated hgot and gpt with a normal synthetic function of an liver uh, uh, in the in the month of september 2020 uh, subsequent uh, the cbc was outside done which was showing a normal and ultrasound also normal uh, subsequent lfts uh, was not uh, was not available but jaundice reduced and patient uh, was asymptomatic uh, that time also uh, kft was done which was normal Uh, thyroid function test was normal viral markers in the form of hepatitis a e b c was negative patient denied any taken any uh, drugs there was no history of an alcohol and advised investigations like autoimmune panels and adders which was patient was not milling at that time so was also advised because of of a jaundice which was not explainable at that time uh, because of any viral markers and autoimmune markers was negative but patient was not willing Uh, so we came to a uh, diagnosis maybe the patient was having some uh, sero negative type of viral hepatitis since the patient having a very significantly elevated otpt uh, was advised uh, other investigations and uh, this uh, uh, virological markers after 4 weeks uh, was started on supportive treatments patient jaundice improved and symptomatically patient was better and uh, lft was also showing a normalizing uh, trend uh, for we, for which the reports as i said was not available uh, over the period of last uh, patient was asymptomatic and now again presented uh, in the month of uh, april 2021 with uh, with patient where he conquered and covid and uh, uh, have received a medications in the form of azithromycin doxycycline and ivermectin uh, since then so he has received he, he has received a, so he has developed a covid in the month of april and now in the month of may second week he started developing again a prodrome of weakness fatigue uh, followed uh, by jaundice and mild prurited since 18th of may that time you can see again the uh, again the bilirubin was uh, uh, was very high mounting around 35 with a markedly elevated hgot hgpt in the form of 20 more than uh, more than 25 times the upper limit of uh, normal with normal synthetic function of an liver so repeat we are, again we are repeated well uh, the second episode of an jaundice with viral hepatitis uh, sorry hepatitis we are again evaluated we found hepatitis a and e was negative viral markers were negative uh the first line uh, autoimmune panel again repeated which was also negative igg was uh, 1580 with upper limit uh, showing 1800 uh, 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 serum seroplasmin was normal this speedy was normal and also uh, 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 iga ttg and kf ring for evaluation of wilson was also negative since having some amount of fever uh, we also evaluated in the form of infective workup in the form of leptospira scrub typhus was also negative Uh, but we didn't deem any form of cytomegalovirus since uh, we didn't uh, perform uh, even epstein barr virus also uh, we also evaluated for his uh, d dimer fibrinogen which was also negative endoscopy doesn't show any form of any varices and it was normal so in in view of this uh, patient uh, we, we we validated that may the patient having some form of sero negative hepatitis primary markers of uh, viruses was negative so we 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 go ahead with an liver biopsy that is an ultimate um, so might give an answer to us so we perform a uhg guided uh, liver biopsy and may i help dr r ravi to just really comment on this uh, liver biopsy yeah you most of the liver biopsies are handled in my setup with dr kameni she would like to make comment on this this biopsy was adequate with uh, the 11 to 12 portal tracts uh, there was some lobular disarray uh, hepatocyte shows uh, cholestasis uh, with uh, intralobular infiltrate of neutrophils lymphocytes uh, portal tract uh, show moderate uh, lymphocytic infiltrate with few neutrophils and there is some infiltration into the ductal wall causing ductulitis so basic and the stage 2 by 6 fibrosis so we score we gave us chronic hepatitis with the hai score of uh, uh, 7 by 18 and stage uh, 2 by 6 fibrosis so this was more of a hepatocytic type of injury like uh, was hepatocellular injury mostly right. 
both portal and hepatocellular. With that, uh, we saw the patient who is just at the time of COVID and this report of biopsy more seristy of some form of acute and chronic type of hepatitis with markedly elevated jaundice. We thought whether are we dealing really with a, some COVID type of infection that patient having uh, this thing. Any drugs that patient is consuming that time because lot of lot of things were going around in the time of COVID or something really it is unrelated to any of the above things. Really want some chairperson to comment like what can the what do you think about any the guy who is a such a high jaundice, anything that we are work up. Yeah, it would favor drugs, some sort of yeah. drugs. So that time I also, uh, we also thought the same. So, uh, so we, we just, uh, there are always a COVID. So we started that whether a COVID, uh, it was secondary to some COVID. Uh, so COVID virus is known to have affinity for cholangiocytes and hepatocytes. Uh, there was a, as a, there was an abnormal liver enzymes has been seen in a, in a patient who's having a COVID with majority having any mild uh, type of illness. But the odd, odd points uh, favoring any COVID related, any uh, hepatocellular injury was the onset of jaundice was after two weeks of the COVID. And there was no evidence in the literature that is supporting any like patient having some COVID related hepatocellular injury at that time. Uh, then we come if there is an ischemic considering a very high, but since an LDH was normal, no signs of any hypotension, no any history. So ischemic hepatitis was well see, uh, was also unlikely and histology also not suggest to any form of any necrosis. Uh, yes, there was some reported some Chinese paper where uh, they found that there is a COVID cholangiopathy, but our patient having more about a hepatocellular type of an injury rather than any, any cholestatic type of injury. So that was also very unlikely. Uh, then we also uh, saw that whether it, we are dealing with some sero autoantibody negative autoimmune hepatitis, but it is definitely a diagnosis of exclusion. Gamma globulin was normal and biopsy also does not show any classical forms of an autoimmune hepatitis in the form of rosity or other features of autoimmune hepatitis. So yes. The patient had received uh, this type of drugs in the because he was accounted for this azithromycin, toxicycline, ivermectin before the at the time of a COVID infection when he was having. Uh, but azithromycin, as you see, there's 1.2% uh, of patients having low asymptomatic liver enzymes. It mostly a cholestatic type of an injury. Our patient having a hepatocellular type of injury. Uh, vanishing bile duct syndrome can be one of the presentation, but it is really always a cholestatic type of injury. Uh, what azithromycin uh, uh, what azithromycin can land up but it uh, can can cause a doxycycline hepatoxicity is very rare uh, can can one to two can occur one to two weeks after the consumption it can cause either hepat hepatocellular cholestatic mix and autoimmune like hepatitis with minoxycline has been described as doxycycline but it was uh, again a very debatable type of diagnosis we would have uh, made uh, ivermectin same uh, but uh, only one case report till clinically apparent uh, liver injury was seen but it was still without jaundice so or guy have a very high jaundice with a this all three three drugs what becomes our but not supporting our uh, uh, patients epidemiology and also laboratory features so we go into a, a detailed history so at that time patient was taking lot of immuno boosters at the time of covid uh, and there was a, uh, and then in the first wave of covid in the month of july in the month of july august 2020 there was jaundice and patient has took the same preparation for covid in april may 2021 which is called mostly a guloi. It is a, some a RAS juice. We taken a 30 ml BD and during a duration of around three to four weeks. So patient was consumed some immunity, uh, says immunity booster in the form of which contains a guloi in it. So this was, then we also calculated a RUCAM score here and the RUCAM score also coming very strongly as a plus seven suggestive of an, uh, there is a, uh, there is an uh, quite high possibility of an uh, drug induced liver, uh, liver injury. Yes, then there is a paper from AI, uh, this paper from uh, Anand Kulkarni, uh, which suggests to that uh, there is a liver injury during COVID-19 pandemic. It is a multicentric nationwide study from India. Uh, it was a Gilo hepatitis, what they called. It was a retrospective study of 49 patients. Uh, there are presentation of hepatitis like uh, presentation, worsening of uh, chronic liver disease and presentation like autoimmune hepatitis. And they also accounted some death in 10% of patient and out of some patient also required some transplantation during this thing. So Giloy was uh, right now that time very, very, very prone of causing all sort of liver injury. So mechanism of liver injury, secondary to Giloy can be of direct drug toxicity, secondary to some metabolites, immune mediated or idiosyncratic. Uh, so final diagnosis, we made that patient guy uh, having a very high jaundice secondary to any Giloy. So in conclusion, a sudden surge in the hepatocellular jaundice during COVID era without any known etiological factors can conclude to give an idea of an um, Giloy type of hepatitis. Rechallenge can be seen in two patients, suggest to have a strong association. 
temporal association between glyoic consumption and jaundice is seen we feel that this is the observation of association casualty needs to be evaluated and same is the observation of the other researchers from in india where they also has seen that glyo has caused some type of liver injury thank you thank you bhushan Hello, sir. Yes, sir. I think it was consumed a, a, a month, a month prior. So I think uh, in this paper, which I was on the part yes, that sir. he showed, the median duration of liver enzyme alteration and jaundice was forty-three days. From the consumption of glyo, it was the median period, and mostly it unmarks autoimmune hepatitis. So many people who had possibility of autoimmune hepatitis, glyo is thought to unmark the autoimmune features. The liver biopsy will show a lot of neutrophils, uh, but all of our biopsies showed eosinophilia because we only took biopsy proven cases in our study. There was two sheets of jaundice. Uh, apart from zero sheets, I think. So, what was the cause of it? Has it happened two episodes? Uh, yeah, the intervention of Gila. There was there was a other intermediate zero sheets one. He is asking. Yeah, uh, he had taken Gila in two thousand twenty and again two thousand twenty one. Yeah, but yes, uh, the jaundice was in two thousand twenty one, I think. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Around eight months. Okay. Okay. Uh, sir, patient having jaundice in both the time, as Doctor Mukhtar sir has saying. Yeah. Yeah, Doctor, uh, that he was consumed uh, uh, this during first uh, wave of COVID. Also, he has consumed glyo. That time also he has developed some amount of an jaundice, which was uh, improved on his own. And now definitely this time a uh, florid jaundice uh, type uh, hepatitis. Uh, the patient is presented with us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any comments from our audience? And Mishra from Jabalpur. Yeah, welcome. My question is with. डॉक्टर मुक्केवार हाँ माय क्वेश्चन इज दैट कि पैंक्रियाटिक फैट हाउ टू रिड्यूस एंड इट कॉजेस डिफिकल्टी इन द बीटा सेल फंक्शन सो कैन यू एक्सप्लेन इज दैट सर यू आस्क अबाउट अ पैंक्रियाटिक फैट लॉस Pancreatic. You are talking about stool fat. That is a isolate of Langhans or a pancreas. The question is better. हेलो यस सर हेलो एम आई ऑडिबल यस सर आई एम डॉक्टर सुशील कैली फ्रॉम जबलपुर सी अलोंग विद दिस कोविड फाइंडिंग्स व्हाट एवर वी हैव बीन नरेटेड ओवर हियर व्हाट वेयर द कॉनकमिटेंट फाइंडिंग इन अदर सिस्टम्स नोटिस बाय यू व्हाइल ट्रीटिंग दिस दिस पेशेंट Yes, sir. This uh, this guy, uh, this the rest of the systemic examinations was really normal, so that does not having any respiratory side types of symptoms at that. If I I can recall, Doctor Mukher sir is also supporting that there is no respiratory system. It was uh, presented with and more upon hepatitis only. See, in your experience in the COVID period, what were the percentage of uh, precipitation of diabetes and affecting the liver in that way the resistance of the patient? So how many percent of People, I mean, patients who came across while while treating this uh, liver enlargement with the con concomitant COVID. It's, uh, may I yeah. handle this question to more physician? Yeah, yeah. That uh, Dr. Akash uh, wants to say bye and uh, exit. Uh, we want to thank you, Akash, uh, for being us with us and for all your expert comments.
thank you dr akash sir yeah yeah, yeah. thank you akash thank you so much yeah now this question is very valid as far as the development of diabetes in the yes sir uh, really at present i can't answer okay, anyone in our uh, hall can answer the prevalence of diabetes uh, or or some other system involvement diabetes uh, diabetes is uh, uh, well known in uh, uh, post covid uh, times multiple uh, reports have appeared of uh, very high hb1c and very high sugars and not related steroids even after tapering the steroids uh, post covid there has been uh, uh, there have been reports of uh, impaired beta cell function that gives rise to a prolonged hyperglycemia and hyperglycemia related complications like frozen shoulders and uh, other other complications and uh, diabetes uh, is supposed to be secondary to the beta cell destruction by covid which is seen during the peri covid period which has resulted in a transient increase in hyperglycemia which has subsequently come down but then direct hepatocyte injury there has been direct islet cell injury as well okay yes thank you uh, bhushan yes, we now conclude uh, our uh, clinical meeting today thanks sir yeah yeah <clears throat> uh, from uh, all our chairpersons uh, we thank uh, midas team for uh, inviting us here uh, sir you can take over now for okay yes, yes okay i'll not make everybody wait further so thank you uh, uh, all the audience here and the chairpersons in nagpur for uh, uh, coming and gracing this occasion uh, all the online chairpersons thank you mithun uh, thank you for being here thank you dr shukla and uh, thank you ashok and i would like to sincerely thank uh, all the participants and the chairpersons in amravati uh, jabalpur as well as akola uh, i we hope that you enjoy your drinks and dinner and we will not keep you away for too long so thank you so much and thank you all for coming thank you okay thank you so much for inviting us thank you mukhtar sir for all the help thank you